In October 2015, AlphaGo, a deep learning network that was trained to play the board game Go, beat the then reigning European Go champion Fen Y, five to zero. This was the first time that a computer program had ever beaten a professional Go player. Five months later, an improved version of AlphaGo would go on to play the then top player in the world, Li Sao Do, four to one. Now to put this in the kind of context of why this was such an impressive feat for a computer program to accomplish, the estimated number of possible legal Go positions on the board is somewhere around two times 10 to the 170 possibilities. To give an idea of what that actually means, that's the actual amount of zeros of how many possible positions a Go board can have. Now, this isn't so much about if the program can explicitly represent all of these possibilities. Because for computational reasons, that's near impossible. What's important is that the program is one that intuitively plays the game in much the same way that a professional Go player does. Now, AlphaGo was developed using a combination of two different methods. One is supervised learning, where programmers take uh, expert data sets, in this, came, in this case, games played by master Go players, strategies developed over the years, and encode knowledge representations into the system. And then this is used in conjunction with reinforcement learning, which is the method by which the program is trained on optimal next steps from those already pre-programmed games into a series of rewards and punishments. <clears throat> now, fast forward further, this past December, those working at DeepMind developing AlphaGo created a new program, AlphaGo Zero. Uh, and this uses something slightly different. It takes a blank slate approach. So instead of explicitly training the next steps in the game, or the best possible combinations and moves, the trainers take the basic rules of the game and teach the program how to learn itself. So how does it go about developing its own strategies? And now in the conclusion of their paper on this program, the authors state, humankinds have accumulated Go knowledge from millions of games played over thousands of years, collectively distilling into patterns, proverbs, and books. In the space of a few days, starting Tabula Rasa, a blank slate, AlphaGo Zero was able to rediscover much of the Go knowledge as well as novel strategies that provide new insights into the oldest of games. Now, what does it mean for a computer program to discover Go knowledge or to develop novel strategies? And how is it that the programmers themselves didn't know how this occurred? Uh, and this really brings us to the topic of what I want to talk with you guys about today. Uh, and that's really the role of machine intelligence and these types of deep neural networks and kind of the future of knowledge and what does it mean for us to know something. Uh, and now I don't really want to talk about any kind of like singular idea. There's not one thing I want to talk to you about. I want to motivate a way of thinking about this. Thinking about the role of these types of artificial intelligences in our society and in how we produce knowledge. Now ultimately, this is an issue of automation. And humans have been trying to automate our activities since the beginning of human civilization. When we toiled in the fields producing crops, we tried to do that at a greater scale. So we delegated the task to beasts of burden, quite cruelly, but we did it. And that was an automation of the intelligent activity of plowing fields. Uh, fast forward, and in the Industrial Revolution, we automated the task of manufacturing goods. And we did so at a dizzying pace, freeing up time for humans to perform other activities. And then with the advent of computers, we automated the process of arithmetic and logical operations. Instead of humans having to laboriously calculate by hand these difficult mathematical equations, we could automate that with computers through a symphony of electrical buzzing. And now with artificial intelligence, we've automated problem solving tasks at a level previously unimaginable. But I want to talk about the automation of not only intelligence, as in problem solving and a task at hand, but rather the automation of knowledge. And what does that look like? Now, I want to stay agnostic about whether or not machine knowledge in this way is inevitable, or whether the stirrings are already occurring. And I rather want to pose the kind of hypothetical question. I'm a philosopher, so we're interested in these types of hypothetical questions. To really get a grip before 
what I think we're already seeing is going to occur. Uh, and that's really what is the role of this sort of artificially produced knowledge in our society in general. Now, there's a couple of questions that I want you to keep in the back of your head while I discuss these types of deep neural networks. And that's really a question about yourself. So how do you know what you know? What does it mean to know something? Now, this might seem like kind of a typically confusing and annoying philosophical question, because it is. It is a philosophical question. But it's something I think we need to be asking ourselves in these types of situations. And these situations where it's not humans creating knowledge, like in the case of AlphaGo Zero, it created new Go knowledge or rediscovered Go knowledge and novel strategies. So what does it mean for that program to know? And more importantly, how do we incorporate this type of knowledge into our own bodies of knowledge? What are, the, what are the kind of criteria that we need to select the kind of knowledge that should be brought into our society and that that shouldn't? Now, with regards to AlphaGo Zero and these AlphaGo programs, or say any other deep neural network that uses a similar style of architecture, you might be asking yourself, if the programmers and developers created this system, then isn't it really them that produce the knowledge? Uh, and I think at this moment, it's good to take a step back and realize if the developers could track kind of each step that the system took to produce that knowledge or to come to some sort of decision, then the answer would probably be yes. It is the programmers or the developers in that scenario that produce the knowledge. But that's not the case with these types of systems like AlphaGo Zero. As we saw with DeepMind in the conclusion of their paper, they, they said it came up with novel strategies and rediscovered this knowledge, but that they themselves couldn't actually track how that happened. So I really want to ask this question, what is the role of that type of knowledge in our society? <clears throat> now there's a name for these types of systems, these types of systems that are very complex and may have a number of kind of hidden layers in how they come into a decision. Uh, and those are black box systems. Now they're called black box systems precisely because you can't crack them open and kind of discover how each step was taken to come to some output. Um, and that's important because you know, these systems weren't built with the idea of transparency in mind. They were built for efficiency. So we shouldn't be particularly surprised when we look at these types of really complex neural networks and we can't figure out exactly how it got from stage one to the end, to the end result, stage two. And I think this sort of disconnect between the outcomes of these black box systems and our own kind of expectations of what we would assume these systems would produce uh, kind of creates this uh, intelligence jet lag where we're always playing catch up to the conclusions of these really sophisticated deep neural networks uh, and what we would have expected the outcomes to be. And I think this intelligence jet lag between the really task specific and optimized efficient problem solving that these types of systems do and the more kind of general and nuanced reasons that humans generally look for in our explanations presents a really interesting challenge for us in how we see the role of knowledge in our society and specifically artificially produced knowledge in our society. And I think what's mostly important about this too is in situations with real life consequences. Now with the AlphaGo Zero, if the program was to make some sort of mistake in moving a piece, I don't think any of us would consider that to have sort of dire ethical impacts or general devastating impacts on society. But what happens when these types of deep neural networks get applied to situations with real life consequences, where it's not merely a quantitative judgment on where to place a piece on a board, but rather a qualitative one? Uh, and we're already sort of at the point where this is happening. So these types of black box systems already used in a number of real life scenarios with real life consequences. Say for instance, in determining whether or not someone will default on their loan, the likelihood that they would, or in cases of criminal recidivism in determining sentencing uh, for particular cases, the likelihood that someone will recommit a crime. Now this brings us to another kind of issue that's being discussed right now, and that's the issue of algorithmic bias. So the issue of data sets themselves being biased because humans collect data and we have biases that we can't control for. And these outcomes, say in the case of the criminal recidivism, applying these deep neural networks, they've found that some of these systems have racial bias. Now this is a situation where there's real life consequences. 
a situation where it's not merely a quantitative judgment, but a qualitative one, where people's lives are impacted in a really meaningful and important way. And this also highlights another issue, and that's sort of the disconnect between our own motivations in using these programs, say for efficiency in, senten in trial sentencing, or our motivations to be more equitable and just, but the motivations of these systems not matching those of our own, where in the case of criminal recidivism and the likelihood that someone will re recommit a crime, they've been found to have racial bias, and that's an unjust or inequitable outcome of these programs. And we need to start thinking about how those motivations and our own match, or how to make them match. Now there's kind of a problem, which I think highlights this really well, that sort of inserted itself into the popular sphere, uh, and that's the trolley problem. I'm not sure if any of you have heard of this before. I think it was on the good place at some point. Uh, but the trolley problem is this. Imagine that there's a train sort of barreling out of control, and on that train tracks, there's five people tied. Now you're standing next to a lever that if you pulled, would switch the tracks the train runs on, avoiding those five people. Now here's the problem. On that train tracks that you can switch to, there's one person tied. So your choice is, do I let the train continue on its way and kill five innocent people tied to the track? Or do I willfully pull the lever and condemn one person to a gruesome fate? Now this is a tough ethical decision, and in that situation, hopefully you would act. You would either choose not to pull the track or pull the lever for whatever reason, or you would choose to save five people and condemn one person to death. Now more importantly for this discussion, for what we're talking about today, how would you actually come to that decision? How would you know which decision to make? And I think reflecting on our own kind of decision process and how we get to this gives us clues for what we should expect out of these very complex deep neural networks. For one, say you pull the lever, you might access all the different steps that got you to that point. Why you would pull the lever or not pull the lever. You might also offer some sort of justification. Some reason why you think it's better to willfully condemn one person to death while letting five, or saving five others, or vice versa. You might also offer up some sort of motivations. Uh, and this is what's kind of interesting. So we might say in this situation, I was motivated to save as many lives as possible, so I decided to pull that lever, even though that meant murdering a human on that track. But for all you know, that one person on the track, or for all we know, was your mortal enemy. And your motivations weren't particularly just, because you wanted that person to die in the end. But the point is, is that you're able to access and justify and give reasons for your motivations in this situation. And I think, you know, with the way that this technology is going, with the way that neural networks are being applied to our lives in general, these are sort of situations that will come up. Say in the case of driverless cars, where it might be offered with two unpalatable choices, like in the trolley problem, and it has to make a decision. And we should expect it to make a decision and make, it, make the right one. But we should also, I think, demand more than this. We should demand that it has some ability to not only access its own steps and states, justify its decision, and offer some indication of the motivations of how it came to that decision, just as we would if you were in that situation. And I think really this leads us to the point of demanding some sort of criteria for knowledge in these types of artificial systems. And this is really the way of thinking that I want to impress upon you, is that we need to start thinking about how we assess knowledge in these very complex deep neural networks. Now, I want to give sort of a caveat uh, remember, this was a hypothetical question in the beginning, to kind of motivate thinking about what it means to artificially produce knowledge in this way. Uh, artificial knowledge or machine knowledge in this sense is probably a long ways off. AlphaGo Zero gives us some indications that the stirrings are already occurring, and I think this is the perfect time to start asking these questions, to sort of get ahead of the curve on what it means for machines to produce knowledge in this way. Uh, but it's a difficult task. Uh, there's nothing easy about accomplishing this. Uh, so I think it's going to take kind of all hands on deck. And now for people in general, say people who aren't developing these types of systems, who aren't looking at the philosophical implications, it's still important that we ask ourselves the question of what we should expect out of artificial intelligence and machine knowledge in this way. Because it has an impact on our lives, as we already saw with how it's being applied 
to cases of defaulting on loans or criminal recidivism, or in these ethical situations like the hypothetical trolley problem. These have real-life consequences and impacts on our society, and that affects all of us. So I hope that after today, I've motivated you enough to start thinking about these worries of machine intelligence and the future of knowledge. Thank you.